roll. Uh, why don't we do that now? Um, so, Mr. Secretary, would you be able to take the roll? Uh, Mr. Chair, did we go back to a voice roll? Yes, I believe that that is acceptable. Okay. Now, since I never I never did this, but if I mispronounce your name, I'm from Germany and I have lived in other countries, so please correct me uh, with all the different names. And if I superimpose some experience from China or other places, then I probably got it wrong. So it's um, Stephen Musto. Yes. Anne and, and Dameron. Present. Vicky Chon. Zayan Khan. Amanda Dang. Kevin Ching. Here. Thank you. Uh, Yen Chen. Uh, present. Thank you. Divya Rani Belamkonda. Here. Annie He. Annie. Prakash Tasot. Uh, I don't see Anna Shiro yet, but she's probably coming, right? Yes, she's she's one of the she's trying to log on right now. Okay, I'll look for look out. Thank you, Ms. Salinas. Uh, Abhay Kukarni. Aparna Balamaran. And then Mr. Banerjee. Is it Banerjee? How yeah. do you say your last name, please? Yeah, Banerjee. Banerjee. Okay, Siddhartha Banerjee. Hey, yeah, present. Thank Thanks. you so much. Larona Jones. Michael Gardner. Present. Thank you. Uh, Christy Rocha. Here. Ms. Salinas. Here. Nancy Pfeiffer. Trustee Jones. And last but not least, Trustee Prasad, please. Uh, here. Thank you. That concludes the roll, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I believe, is that, can you confirm that we are short of a quorum? I believe that we're currently eight, uh, which is short by three. Yes. With that in mind, I don't believe we can take a vote on the minutes until we have a quorum. Uh, so I believe we will jump then into our presentation on universal uh, transitional kindergarten. And we have a director of elementary education, uh, Robin Sert here to do that presentation. This is a, this is a big thing that there's a lot of big things happening in the world and in our state, but this is a pretty big shift in education and, and something that it's exciting to be uh, in the forefront of. So Robin, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Mr. Musto. Um, good evening. I'm Robin Sert, the director of elementary education. Um, I'm just going to briefly give you um, an overview of our current TK program, TK stands for Transitional Kindergarten. And as Mr. Musto was um, speaking about, we are excited that it will be expanding and it's now going to be called Universal TK. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next one. Essentially, Transitional Kindergarten is a bridge between preschool and kindergarten. Um, Transitional Kindergarten is a two-year um, two kindergarten program is the way we build our curriculum and our instruction. Universal TK came about, I'm sorry, Transitional Kindergarten came about um, with the Kindergarten Readiness Act of 2010. Um, if you had little ones starting school at that time, you know that we changed the birth dates from September, sorry, from December 1st to September 1st. There were a few years where we rolled back the um, enrollment start date. And so what we found is that we needed to support our students whose birthdays fell between September 2nd and December 1st, who were no longer able to uh, enroll in kindergarten. And so transitional kindergarten came about to support those students because we didn't want those students to wait an additional year to begin their educational journey. And so we implemented transitional kindergarten here in Fremont um, several years ago. I think this is our 11th year. And again, it's a two year program to bridge the gap for all of the, the developmental needs. Um, it's really an opportunity for us to build those foundational skills for our students who weren't quite age ready for kindergarten yet, but we wanted to build those foundational skills in literacy and math, as well as how to be a student in class supporting the social emotional needs. This year, 
um, Assembly Bill 130 was passed. And so we are going to be expanding the age of students that we can offer transitional kindergarten to. Um, it has shifted now to universal transitional kindergarten because we are looking at um, over the next year with birth date changes to eventually offering this opportunity to our really young learners. Of, they may be three years old for a couple of weeks before school starts. Um, and then they'll be four and up. So over the next few years, the birth date change for transitional kindergarten students won't just be from September 1st to December 1st. In our upcoming school year from 20, the 22-23 school year, we are going to be offering transitional kindergarten to children whose birth dates fall between September 2nd and February 2nd. In the 23-24 school year, that um, that range will widen from September 2nd until April 2nd. The following year, it'll be from September 2nd till June. And then in 25-26, um, we will be offering this opportunity to students whose fourth birth date is by September 1st. So that's why I was sharing, we might have some three-year-olds since we start in August, um, who will be three for just a few weeks, who will have the opportunity to join us in transitional kindergarten. Our transitional kindergarten is taught by highly qualified teachers. They have a multiple subject um, credential, as well as having early childhood education units and being specialized in that field, because we know it's important to support our students who are um, just finishing up preschool age and getting ready for kindergarten. And so it's really important to have specialized teachers who focus on that developmental age. It's a win-win for all because it's within our public school system and it's again building that foundational experience for our, our youngest learners in the areas of math and um, science and social studies and as I'll share, I think it's the next slide. Um, well, I'll just share really quickly that uh, Fremont Unified was one of the first districts to offer transitional kindergarten. Um, one of our teachers um, Clara Glenister was one of the very first teachers in the county, and she's, there's actually videos you can watch with her on there. And our, our model is replicated in many school districts. We currently have 20 classrooms, 18 of which are in person, two are virtual at 15 schools. You can go ahead and go to the next one. But essentially, our TK program is really to support um, students in their early learning. So it's introducing them to emergent reading skills, writing skills, and math skills. And emergent really means that it's developmentally appropriate. So it's our youngest learners, but it's really developmentally appropriate. And really it's a focus on play. And so we, we are excited that if you walk in a TK classroom, you will see um, you know, a kitchen set up and students doing dramatic play because they are focusing on literacy skills by, um, through dramatic play and, and really focusing on collaboration and cooperation through play-based learning. And that's sometimes our families walk in and they say, oh, the kids are just playing. Play is at the heart of learning. And we really want to continue that foundational opportunity for our students. Um, and when our students are placed in appropriate, so this is age appropriate learning, when they're, when they're placed in appropriate age appropriate settings, they move more readily um, and develop stronger skills with you know, health, positive self-esteem. Um, they master important fundamental skills needed for success later in, in their educational journey. And so what I'm sharing all of this with you tonight is to really share with families that you may know out there who have a, who have a child whose birth date falls between September 2nd and February 2nd that this is a great first step for children to really embark on a, a successful educational journey is to join our TK teams because in these classrooms, our teachers are doing a phenomenal job of providing a foundation um, for our students to be successful. They do it, as I shared with play, they focus on social emotional learning and it's really building those independent skills of our youngest learners. And go ahead. This is just a wonderful um, graphic that really shares that TK is all about the connection between home and the classroom um, and just looking at those social emotional learning that happens in the classroom 
you know, working on self-management, self-awareness, social awareness, relationship skills, how do we work together, um, and really, really focusing on responsible decision making, even at the young age of four and five, and then how all our classrooms and our schools and our community works together in partnership to support our students. Again, just learning through play, um, it's the foundation that, uh, that all of the rest of their educational experience can be built on. What we found is children are very successful when they join our TK program. Our kindergarten teachers can see the difference in students who've participated in our transitional kindergarten versus students who have not. Um, they come in more um, confident, they're ready to learn, they know the routines of school, so we do have an academic focus, but we really focus on play to reach them through, uh, to reach the academics. For next year, we plan to um, increase our enrollment with the age difference. We are almost planning to double the amount of students we can offer transitional kindergarten to. Um, it's, it's an exciting opportunity to go from 18 in-person classes to 24. We don't have a TK at every school, but we do have one within every attendance area. So again, my, my um, hope tonight is that you can share this information with your you know, friends, your you know, colleagues, just what a wonderful opportunity transitional kindergarten is for our students. You can go ahead. Um, and this is just to share with you what those birthday changes look like again. Um, for this year, it was TK students who were born between September 2nd and December 2nd. That will change next year to September 2nd to February 2nd. 2324, um, we will expand until April 2nd, 2425 until June 2nd. And then finally, as I shared before, um, students whose fourth birthday occurs by September 1st. And these are just all the wonderful things that we, you know, offer in our classrooms. The class size is 24 to 1. Um, with the passing of Assembly Bill 130, and we know our children are getting younger and younger in our classes, the ratio is now 12 to 1. So in our TK classrooms, we won't just have a credential teacher, we will also have a paraprofessional, um, or we call them instructional paraprofessionals who will support the students as well. So there'll be two adults for 24 students um, and we will follow all of our protocols. If you have people who are interested, please have them visit our um, district website. There is, a, there is a transitional kindergarten link where you can learn more from teachers, um, see some testimonials, but also more importantly, you can learn how to enroll in our TK program. Again, this is an exciting opportunity for our district to um, enroll more students, especially our youngest learners, and build those really strong foundational fundamental skills. All right, so thank you very much, Ms. Sir. Um, does anyone have any questions that they would like to, to ask? Uh, Michael Gardner. Hi, I had a question about students with IEPs. Um, what is there a special education teacher associated with the program and um, how does that work? Yes, we actually have um, at our, we have a, a special education preschool called Glinkler. We're actually opening a new site called Ricks as well. And so we're working with those teachers of um, students who are transitional kindergarten age and offering some mainstreaming opportunities as well, depending on the students, you know, IEP goals. But we do work with our Glinkler and Ricks staff. And if people don't know, I believe students can be identified at age three with IEPs. Is that the youngest age? Yeah. So it's maybe something that people in the community don't uh, know. Are there any questions? Other questions? Well, one thing, one reason uh, this is uh, such an important thing uh, for this group also is that um, unduplicated students uh, traditionally do not have as much uh, pre-K instruction. So this will standardize things across the state and it should be a benefit to our, um, to all of our students, but to our um, unduplicated students. Uh, Mr. Chen has a question. Um, so Stephen, you brought up a good point. Is there any other criteria um, other than age and birth date? So even if there's an unduplicated student on a waiting list, or I, I, I don't know if there's going to be a waiting list, but 
I imagine at some point, you know, we may have some inequities and not and have a waiting list. So actually, we won't have a waiting list for every student that's age eligible. We have to offer a spot to those students. So it's just like if you were to register for kindergarten or first grade, um, we would offer a spot to every child. So if we needed to, we would just increase the amount of classes that we have. So a quick follow up to that. Is there any requirement for upgrading uh, the facilities such as bathrooms, age appropriate uh, facilities? Um, you know, having a paraprofessional mm -hmm. helps, but if the restroom facilities are not in the classroom or within the eyesight of the instructor, that means the paraprofessional is taking the children out to use the restroom facilities and such. Yeah, it definitely is a big um, area that our TK teachers and I are working on, on what that looks like with our, especially once we get to four-year-olds, really young four-year-olds, possibly three-year-olds, and what that um, looks like. Um, we are working on some requirements for potty training, obviously, because we're a public school and we're um, supporting children who are already potty trained in this program. But what we do, um, we have title, it's called Title V. And so we have to be compliant with the Title V requirements for classrooms and facilities. All of our classrooms are compliant. Um, there's a minimum square footage um, that we meet. And then if they don't have a uh, bathroom within the classroom, it has to be within a complex, within a certain amount of, of um, they all have to be in the same complex. So they all have to be near a bathroom. And so we meet all of those Title V requirements. But it is definitely something that we're planning for next year on, you know, obviously those first weeks of school of getting used to, you know, using a restroom that might not be in the classroom. Most of our transitional kindergarten classrooms do have restrooms. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Chan? Yeah, I just had a question on um, what we're doing to put the information out there so that parents know that we have the TK program coming and that, you know, it is just more accessible to all our community members. Yes, thank you. Um, so we held a um, transitional kindergarten parent education night. The TK teachers did a wonderful job presenting to families um, earlier in March. I've been able to come here this evening as well as DLAC. Excuse me. Um, our um, English Language Advisory Committee, our district level committee. So I shared the same information there as well. And then we have a website that has information on how to enroll, what are the birth dates, and and pertinent information. So doing a little bit of a roadshow with TK, really trying to help um, spread the word. I think I see Divya's hand next, and then uh, Ann Dameron. Oh, I think you're on mute. Yes, I was on mute. Uh, my question is more towards the uh, kids. They're getting younger and younger. Uh, so, I mean, traditionally, we've seen that in the regular TK or even in the kindergarten classes, the first few weeks are very difficult. And you also mentioned the point about uh, children not being potty trained and all. So wouldn't it be a burden on the teachers when they are starting? Uh, I'm sure all these things would have been considered when it is uh, when it has come up. So that's one po uh, portion of it. The second part is, uh, how about the recess and the timings of the school, right? Because earlier the TK and kindergarten kids, they had a different time so that they, they generally don't have to mingle with the regular kids. Uh, and with the elder kids running around and also with younger kids, way too young kids, it's difficult for a single teacher to hold because we've all seen like how the daycares work and all with the kids. So uh, I just wanted to ensure that the teachers are not burdened at the same time. The kids are also having a good time there. Yes, absolutely. You bring up really important points. Um, so there would be the requirement for children to be potty trained before they started. But one piece I um, forgot to share is we will do some professional development before the school year starts with our teachers and our instructional paraprofessionals. Um, we'll do some separately, like working on, you know, what are the developmental needs of students? And then we are, are also going to be meeting with them together because we know that they're going to be a team and how they work together as a team to support all the children in the classroom. And so I think the additional adult, adults in the classroom, A, help with supervision, but they also work collectively together to support the needs of all the students in the classroom, academically, socially, um, emotionally, and just, just 
they work together in collaboration to really make sure that all students' needs are met. Um, in terms of the timing of a TK day, um, it is three hours and 20 minutes. So all of our transitional kindergarten classrooms will have the same amount of time. And then within that time, teachers determine what um, their recess schedules look like. Um, in transitional kindergarten and kindergarten, recess is part of their instructional day because it is really an important part of how they learn how to collaborate, how they cooperate with one another. So recess is part of their instructional day. Yeah, so I hope uh, the new transitional kindergarten classes uh, with the extra kids uh, who are coming, right? We have enough classrooms and playgrounds for the kids especially. Yes, we're very mindful also of where the placement of classes are and make, ensuring that we have, you know, adequate um, playgrounds and access to bathrooms. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anne? I just wanted to quickly add that school site, site staff, particularly in the office, is great at marketing TK at or kindergarten or first grade. We ask all the toddlers how old they are, recommend the programs. I had one today. We post flyers in our bulletin boards and also Dr. Roach's staff in the federal and state preschool programs has done a really great job of making sure that those families know about TK and about kindergarten and that we all know we need enrollment. So everybody's working together and school staff also reaches out. We're blessed with lots of teachers and other staff in our district who have little kids. Their parents are part of mom's groups, WhatsApp groups, everything. When registrations open we encourage everyone to share widely try to get that word out we don't want to miss anyone we don't want to overload anyone so thank you Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Robin, uh, Mr. Thanks for coming tonight. And I think as the, as Mr. Muster was saying, this is really part of our work. And as we start to think about the whole, you know, K-12 experience for our students and really solidifying that foundation for our kids um, and the work we're going to do within the LCAP. So I'll give this back over to, to Mr. Musto. Thank you. And exciting news. So we do have a quorum now, it looks like. Uh, so uh, Mr. Lechner, go ahead. I'm on mute. Uh, I'd like to make two suggestions, Mr. Chair. The first one is that we also have somebody who joined by telephone. Could we find out who that is, please? Yes. It, uh, it's and then the, sec the, sec the second one, sorry, the second one was that if we could vote on the December minutes <laughs> before yes. anybody leaves, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, that was that was my thought too. Is that we would do the uh, public comment and then the vote as well. I I actually think we should probably do the vote first because I, I I'm sorry, I'm a little distracted. I've, someone's even been emailing me about trying to get into the meeting. Uh, so, um, okay, so let's talk about the minutes. So uh, if you can remember back in December, uh, a lot cooler weather than it is today. Uh, we did have a meeting. And we have some minutes uh, represented there. Uh, if, if you could please. Uh, look those over and we will entertain any motions for any alterations or approval. Okay, with uh, no comments, give it one more minute. This is uh, Yan Chen. I make a motion to approve the December 7th minutes. Thank you. Michael Gardner seconds. Okay. Thank you. With the, uh, the motion in the second, uh, can we move on to if anybody has any comments or uh, suggestions? Any further discussion needed? Okay, with that, can we put a uh, motion for approval? Uh, Let's see, Mr. Lechner would be the best way to do this. Let's see. I mean, we can do either can read out the names or we can simply ask if anybody's objecting. I think we'll do the latter. So would there, is there anyone who's objecting to the uh, approval of these minutes? I'll okay. accept that. Except, thank you so much. All right, so now we'll move on to public comment. Um, if there's anyone here uh, to make a public comment, now would be the time. And Mr. Mostro, I don't know if whoever's calling in with the last 
digit uh, on their phone is 73. Is, are you here for a public comment? Or is this, are you a member of our LCAT committee? Okay. Um, I think if we, uh, we get a message that there's public comment to be made, perhaps we can interrupt. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, we're gonna go to uh, the LCAP survey data. So what we've done here is, uh, at this link, we've added the, this year's survey data to the last uh, three years, which has been presented previously. Uh, we just included the bar charts on this one, just a matter to, to get through everything. Um, I, have, I hope you've had time to look through these. Um, actually, some interesting responses, I thought. There is, you, you look at the first three years and there's some definite trends, and then this, this year, some things are different. I, my personal speculation was just that after a year of watching their uh, students in, um, in distance learning, you know, my parents may have a different perspective on things. So I thought some of the results were interesting. Um, so what we're here to do today is, is to talk about these results, but it's really a springboard for talking about the, uh, the LCAP plan itself. And this is, the, this is the point of the year we really are doing brainstorming. And we're coming to community groups like this one to uh, ask, what are some of the ideas that you have? Obviously, the, the survey data should inform a lot of our decisions, uh, but maybe there's something that you can, you're bringing to this meeting that you're thinking, this would be helpful for our unduplicated students. So, um, Ms. Linus, I know we had a, uh, a initial plan to break up into two groups, but uh, we're not gonna do that considering the size of things. Um, should we talk about the survey explicitly first or should we just jump into the, the prompting questions? What do you think? I think it might be interesting to briefly talk about the survey and, and if folks have questions specific to it or any clarifying questions, that, that might be. Thank next you. Um, Ms. Conda. I have a question regarding uh, question 11 before I log off. I, I wanted to quickly check on that. Okay. So uh, there are like almost uh, the same number of uh, uh, answers for agree and don't know, right? right? So it feels as if that parents or whoever is responding are not aware of the enrichment experiences which are available or uh, the way that the school is taking action or the school district is taking action towards uh, kids enrichment, right? So right. that's a little baffling if I may say uh, that even though there are resources and if those are uh, not well known and people are not able to understand, it is maybe not serving the right purpose. Yeah. From from the parents' perspective, from the uh, caregivers' perspective, uh, maybe if they are not aware, the kids also might not be in a place to benefit fully from that. Yes, communication is just the, always a theme, um, but communication from school to home, um, and perhaps there's some consistencies we need to build in. Um, Ms. Chan. Yeah, I kind of wanted to um, piggyback off of Davia's comment as well. It's the same, uh, very similar type of thing with the interventions as well. It's just the previous question. Um, there, it's not as close and it's not as high, but a very similar result with the um, with the agree and the don't know. Um, so we're seeing that with enrichment and intervention. So I think, um, you know, providing more communication as to what supports the schools are doing would be great. Um, and then um, I did have another comment, which was a little alarming, which was on question 14. Um, so if, if nobody else has their hand raised, um, if we can move on to that one too, is that... Um, let me open that one back up again, where my child uh, tells me about a typical school day. The comments are positive. There was, I mean, the highest one is that there was a disagree. Yeah. Yeah. So that one was, a, was alarming to see. It is. And it's also just so inconsistent with years past that it, it that was one that stood out. Mm -hmm. And I, I will just personally comment, the, the don't knows did seem to grow in this uh in this um, uh, administration. So I, I thought that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. 
there any other questions with the uh, the survey itself or the results? Uh, Mr. Chen, Chen, thank you. Um, kind of going on, Victoria, you have the question for intervention, but I want, I'm kind of curious how many of those uh, children um, are actually intervention, you know, the parents that answer the question, you know, because, you know, it's how many students in the school, each of the schools are in intervention. It's a percentage only. So, yeah, the, you know, for a lot of these communication things, it's going to be the district's responsibility to communicate it out to the parents. Um, what we are looking for are what's, what are some of the more um, straightforward and, and effective ways to get that communication. And if you look at things like just don't know, that means we're not, we're not getting across our basic message. So this is a, that was kind of my big takeaway from this is that we need to probably need to be more explicit uh, with what we're doing for each of these uh, questions, because these questions are supposed to represent um, the things that we care about most, uh, the opinion I care about most from parents. Yeah, and the word intervention, I mean, that that is a very important question, yeah. but I think the definition is probably different. This year's um, intervention is off of, you know, some scores off of the iReady and uh, identification. There was specific, you know, newsletters or requests for uh, specific children to be part of the intervention. Whereas I think the prior years, I don't know if that was the case. Um, I'm not as familiar with the prior years that there was a specific intervention program. Dr. Rocha, do you wanna? Yeah, I think, um, you know, intervention is, has multiple um, definitions because it's not just intervention through our e-log program that we initiated this year. Intervention also takes place in the classroom. Intervention can be done uh, before and after school. So it's a variety of different ways to intervene. It's not just one single program or one person, it's multiple iterations. So just to, um, you know, that might be something that we need to, I don't know, uh, codify maybe a little bit more or clarify, but it's not just the one thing because we just started the intervention program through ELOG, but we've always had money uh, in LCAP for intervention services. And so it looks, it's a variety of different things. And um, when we look at the school SIPSAs, that's where they define how they use their funds uh, for intervention. And then again, a classroom also, there's intervention happening in there as well, so. Uh, Ann. Oh, I think we're on mute. Yep. We're talking about the different words for intervention. The parent permission that goes home for a before or after school tells the parent it's an intervention program or that your child would benefit from additional help with reading. But what the kids hear is you've been invited to computer club. You're invited to phonics fun because we want the kids to participate. So it may be that when the a parent, you know, Yen had a good point. Do we know that the kids that are in intervention are answering? No, we don't. But it may be that the parent doesn't transfer the idea to intervention because they know their kids in computer club. So th those are some other um, sort of communication things that um, it, it would be really interesting to, you know, perhaps survey the parents that are invited to summer academy or something like that because then it's a clear intervention group that we're surveying on the same questions just to see if there's a difference. Thank you. Um, Trustee Prasad. So one question, I see that the the survey, the count of people that responded is about 1800. It's 400 lower than last year. So what percentage uh, of people that were actually invited um, uh, I responded in this survey. Well, I don't believe we didn't send out um, we didn't send out via specific emails. We just sent it out to all parents in a bright arrow. So that would okay. That's a significant number of parents, obviously. So this is 
quite frankly, I was disappointed by this result, by these uh, numbers. I was hoping we could get more. We were on the right trend last year. But did you send to everybody that uh, all parents of students that were identified that needed intervention, or is this to all all parents? It was just sent to all student, all student, all parents in the district, parents guardians. Oh wow! Well. Okay, so that. We did send it out twice, and then um, the, we thought we we had hoped. I know folks like Ann, <laughs> Ms. Dameron, they did even special. Uh, we had we gave folks blurbs to put in their newsletters. People were at the site sending it out because we thought lots of times um, families will respond better when it's coming from the site administrator or the or the front office. But unfortunately, we we even had a lower response this time around, and I'm not we're not quite sure around that how to what to attribute that to. Um, one of the more successful things, actually, this is a couple years, is uh, Mr. Gardner put in the comments about Durham. Uh, Durham's principal is very active about getting parents to participate, so we appreciate that. Though my so thing don't was know that the new homework club in elementary, and it's like, oh, that was an intervention for me. Learned something today. So the don't knows here, maybe for, from parents that don't know really what intervention is, because the kids may not be needing that intervention. It's true. So okay. again, it's a matter of defining uh, these things for the community. Right, that's, got right. be, that's got to be our responsibility. Mm -hmm. So there's a need right there, <laughs> clearly identified. Letty, can you maybe kind of give a little background on what you're looking for as far as uh, additional ideas that and how that kind of works its way into the LCAP? Yes, and I'm, I'm going to have uh, Chrissy Rocha kind of jump in as well. <laughs> um, so essentially, um, you know, some of our next steps are, are these. So as we're starting to look at the LCAP and really unpacking the need, we have to really see how, where are we going to target services? What are some of the things that we should continue with? And what are some things that frankly, um, is not working. Um, but I also want to add, this is also a very unusual time because we also have received some other plans and funds from state and federal guidelines that were sent out. So in some respects, um, we were able to give more services uh, for a lot of these same student groups. Um, so that's the good news. And so for even other students who may not have had the opportunity in the past. So an example is we were able to leverage the expanded learning opportunity program funds to augment and have intervention teachers at all sites, even if it was just 50%. Um, this year, we were also able to um, have full-time elementary counselors. Um, and so Th those were some of the things where we were we were able to receive funds and build on the current work of the LCAP. Um, so just wanted to kind of give that framing. And I don't know, Christy, if you want to give framing and then some next steps of what we're going to do next. Yeah, so um, we have been meeting with different groups. Uh, for example, we met with DLAC, uh, reviewed um, currently what was in the LCAP and started to generate some ideas as far as what are some things that the DLAC committee um, would like to see continue and what would be some things they would like to see to increase or, or to expand upon. Um, and so I can share with that unless um, Kevin would like to on um, behalf of DLAC, um, the different things that were shared when we did this. Um, we've also met with principals um, and started to get some feedback from them in regards to just the different uh, data sets that we've shared, sharing these um, survey results, our iReady assessments, and some of our internal data. And so we are starting to see some trends as to what are our kind of strengths and then where's our needs and kind of where to go next steps uh, with the LCAP. Um, so Kevin, would you like to share or would you want me to do that on behalf of DLAC? Uh, will you please share? On behalf of DLAC, please. Sure. So at the Thank DLAC, <laughs> no problem. Um, there was kind of three major things that uh, we heard from the DLAC committee. One was to continue to provide and expand upon parent engagement uh, opportunities for parents and providing that in multiple languages. Um, they felt that that was really important to have that. So a variety of different topics to support uh, our families. 
The other thing that came up from um, DLAC was providing additional supports for newcomers. We've had an influx of students uh, coming from um, Afghanistan and other countries. Um, so providing some additional supports and looking at what type of resources would we would be able to provide to not only support the language acquisition, but as well as um, just, you know, learning how the school system works here in the United States. So um, there was different conversations around that. And the third piece was to expand upon the ELD specialist positions. Um, that was the feedback was if possible to have more than what we have and try to provide uh, more support around that. So those were the three kind of main topics when we discussed at DLAC. Um, what we're hearing uh, on the lines of principles and kind of feedback is a need for a um, some type of math supplemental program. We have it on the ELA side or English language arts side, which is Lexia at the elementary and Reading Plus but trying to find something that we could then um, have on the math side to support around that. Uh, they wanted to continue with counselors and intervention uh, teachers that we currently have in ELOG, so continue that. Uh, in addition, uh, some of the feedback was around looking at behavioralists, um, and this would support students um, with needs of behavior um, providing those types of support. I see Dan giving me thumbs up on that one. Um, I'm trying to recall off the top of my head. Um, Ms. Salinas, was there anything else? That was really it. I think, I think what we learned is that um, the power of having a, a, a dedicated person that's supporting students and groups of students, such as with our counselors or elementary intervention teachers um, that that really seemed to come forward from a lot of a lot of the um, respondents. Oh, I recall. And also at the secondary level, looking at challenge success and kind of uh, expanding upon that as well. All right. Uh, go ahead, Ann. Um, I would just like to thank Dr. Roach's department for the newcomer materials that you provide. Um, they've been super beneficial for all the influx of students that we have from around the world. Today's new student is from Cameroon. Um, but the newcomer packet, the parent portion, as well as the portion that helps the teacher support the students has been amazingly beneficial. So if there's a way to expand some of that, schools would love it. So thank you. Mr. Chen? Um, what uh, Christine noted about uh, the math, I think is important. I mean, we forget that, um, you know, the, and I mentioned this, I think maybe a year ago about test scores. You know, once you get into third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, you start having to explain and be able to prove something. And that's in English, you know, in the classroom. And the student might be able to do it, but they're not able to, you know, converse. <laughs> And the parents are not necessarily able to help, um, you know, translate. Um, I have a lot of friends, they already have problems just <laughs> in English because we learn math the old way. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> much less how they teach math today about proof and stuff instead of just pure memorization. So I think that's something that, you know, we can kind of probe around. And I think there's been some interest, but nobody's really focused on that. we got to get the English portion, you know, English language arts portion first. Um, you know, correct it. Uh, I do have something um, on the earlier point about um, the unduplicated one part is, um, you know, the state provided free meals. And I know the district probably had a lot more data about that and maybe could share, you know, um, is there a lot more kids eating lunch that are not, you know, unduplicated? We have no idea because we don't take row, but we have total numbers. You know, I can imagine maybe the breakfast uh, we probably have more unduplicated, but during the lunchtime, I know that uh, my daughter talks about pizza days, and all of a sudden there's a spike, you know, on the number of students trying to get meals. So I, I think that might be something we we could kind of probe around because that's new data that we don't have from prior years. It's interesting. 
That's good. Yeah, we yeah. can definitely look at that. And unfortunately, the uh, I'm editorializing. Unfortunately, but the the free lunch program is going to be uh, changing uh, starting with summer school. Okay. Um, other questions or comments? Buddy. And, and I, I, I was thinking, you know, what, what, and I'm taking notes, and I know Mr. Lechner takes notes, but um, I think what we could do is also just kind of start thinking about our April meeting, and it, I'm, I'm hearing the need maybe for more data, but I also want to remind folks that we're hoping to bring a draft of the LCAP to you all at the May meeting. So, um, not to accelerate too much, but this will be the time right now. Let, let's keep talking. I'm taking some notes as well. Um, but we're hoping that at the April meeting, we can bring back some more ideas, a little bit more fleshed out based on your input tonight, and then bring in a draft for you to look at and talk about in, at the May meeting. So I just wanted to give that context as well. And let me give you just a real quick prompt. Um, one of the biggest successes, I think, of the FUSD LCAP is the expansion of counseling services. And this year, uh, through the LCAP, we were able to provide a full-time counselor at each elementary school. Um, that was in great part to the advocacy of all, all, all groups, parents, teachers, um, but that is something that uh, we've seen and we've gotten a lot of great feedback for. So I, I think that's, I will turn it over to Ms. Chung. I think we discussed this in the past, but um, I wanted to just kind of reconfirm is as um, keeping the counselors, individual counselors, especially at the elementary sites, um, because uh, that was the big thing that we had done this year was having a counselor at every elementary site. Is that something we're going to be able to continue? So yes, yes, okay. we are. And um, and you know, as we have a you know, we have the uh, the updated template on the LCAP that we're starting to take a peek at. But I want to share that what we're hoping to do is um, within the LCAP find areas where we can also demonstrate where there might be a different funding source helping to pay for the counselor because um, what, and, and I, I don't want to sidetrack us too much, but to give you all further context, we're finding that with these wonderful gifts of, of supplemental funds that we're receiving as a district, um, we're able to pay for things such as augmenting counseling, augmenting intervention, and it is replacing perhaps some of the things we would have paid for originally within the LCAP. But we know that in two years, that funding will go away, let's say, for example, and that some of these um, services may have to return back to the LCAP. So one of the pieces of advice I have from a colleague who's grappling, all districts are grappling with this, is that we go ahead and, and demonstrate within the LCAP a, an alternate funding source for the same service so that we're able to remember and keep at the forefront that we provided the service. It was important to our community and that although the LCAP may not be paying for it this next year, it is something for us to keep at the forefront as a need. Um, uh, and we heard from our community they really, um, they really wanted us to continue with um, counseling as, as one of the, the big things, I think, on the radar. Yeah, and counseling has always been in the LCAP, but we were able to expand it so that every site had a full-time counselor um, through e-log. Mm -hmm. We probably wouldn't be able to do that just because of the unduplicated counts for some of our sites. We've always been able to do part-time. So that's, as Ms. Salinas has mentioned, we've been... There's been an overabundance of different funding sources, which has been great so that we've been able to sustain that and we will. Uh, it's just to note that if the funding does at some point expire, we're going to have to look at that because we do have, unfortunately, some sites that have very low unduplicated counts. And so how do you justify that through supplemental funds? if the counts are very low in comparison to other sites. So that's why we were able to maintain 50% uh, at least at sites. Um, a full time might be a stretch, but that's years to come. Yeah. Mr. Chen? Um, as we come out of COVID and as the schools open up, I, I kind of get a feeling that there's more after school programs, whether it might be chess or art or um, even tennis or something like that. And, and again, I'm, my experience is with the elementary school, that's because that's where my daughter is. But I imagine that's happening all across the district with all different types of programs. So I didn't know how the unduplicated students, you know, with limited 
uh, funds and you know transportation problems and other issues, how they can participate and you know be involved and be able to sign up for some of these programs. That's just a you know a question posed out there. I, I, we don't have an answer today, but you know that's something you know we might have to probe around the edges to maybe you know, get a better, fuller program. So one thing uh, that we mentioned, I believe, last meeting was, again, another funding source that the state has provided. We've There's an abundance, so it's really great, but it's the Extended Learning Opportunities Program, and that is basically after school and 30 days of uh, intercession. That can be either during winter break, spring break, and summer school, and that is targeted specifically for unduplicated students. So we are in the planning stages right now of identifying sites across uh, the district, uh, looking at the sites that have the highest unduplicated count, and it would be exactly that, um, where they're invited to extended uh, opportunities for enrichment, um, doing multiple types of things, not only uh, support with homework, uh, it would go till six o'clock. So students would be basically in some type of after school care until six. Uh, when school is out, it would be a nine hour program, which is per, uh, per the ed code and what is um, the regulations for this funding. Um, so students would not only do homework, but do some physical activities and then have access to art you know, food, um, like science and things like that. So it would be uh, addressing all of those needs. Yeah, I mean, it's good, especially if it's associated with the campus and the program is running, you could check out, go to the tennis and be able to check back in because the, the after school care extends to six o'clock. They could be joining, you know, chess or something like that at a checkers club and then come back in. You know, if, if they have to leave campus and they have to leave, uh, you know, a supervised program, then it kind of falls apart. But I, I like what I'm hearing, but we really have to work hard to make sure it works um, for this, especially maybe the check-in and check-in out. I mean, I, I, I was in a program where my daughter in the preschool was in a check-in and check-out program and it was extended. And I didn't have to worry till about eight o'clock at night if I really, on certain nights. Ms. John? I'm sorry, you know. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I do like that Google Meet tells you you're talking and then you're <laughs> muted. Um, I was wondering, are we still discussing other parts of the survey as well? I don't want to come off of this topic if we're, because um, there's one other thing I wanted to kind of discuss, but it, I know Tracy Jones has her hand up, so I don't know if there was more discussion in uh, this particular area before we move on to another. I think they're related, so I think it'd be appropriate to, 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 to do that. I can just put up the question really quickly. Oh, uh, no, that's okay. Um, I just wanted to kind of point out the discipline question where my school, my child's school partners with families to resolve discipline issues or improve student behavior. Um, again, we're seeing a lot of the agree and the don't know. So um, I know we're rolling out our PBIS program. Um, so I think emphasizing that more with parents. Um, I also know just from uh, teaching in FUSD that it's it's tiered. Uh, there are schools that have been doing PBIS for a few more years. Perhaps that's where those parents that agree more came from uh, versus that don't know. I know there's schools that just, just started uh, PBIS. So just, I think, um, you know, publicizing the program and the model that we use even more um, just to get that support even at home too, I think would be really beneficial for all of our um, students and just knowing that, you know, we as a district are, are, are moving toward this. It's an excellent point. And uh, one thing that you learn when you, you read through the LCAP is that, you know, there's, there's a lot of things involved with it. And PBIS, um, well, first of all, discipline is one of the things that we have to track as part of the LCAP. And so PBIS is one of our, our, our district projects to help improve those numbers. So that uh, it should be represented here and should be represented in other, the, some of the other programs that Ms. Salinas and Dr. Rocha have talked about. Uh, Christy Jones? Yeah, just one of the things that I wanted to mention is great is ELOP sounds with the act you know, offering after school and extended day programs and TK. When I think about this, I think about staffing. And 
every single district in the entire state is going to be looking to staff these programs. And when we can't staff, hire, you know, uh, other agencies or community partners to do this. And I really see, you know, red, red lights are going off for me <laughs> that how statewide are districts going, going to jump into this when we already have staffing shortages. So I, you know, I, I, I don't know when we'll have a sense of how well staffed we are in order to roll out these programs. Um, and for those of you who, who are interested in advocacy and in contact with your legislators, we have not hit the May revise yet. And now is the time to be advocating for more money and more resources so that we can do these things that the state is asking us to do. Um, because I, I just, I, when I meet with trustees all over, you know, the area, we're all wondering how this is going to work when we don't have enough staff to do what we're already doing and we're adding extended TK and we're extending the day to, to add these other programs. I just don't know how this is going to work. One of the, in, in speaking with one of our legislators, he recalls, he recalled a time when there was a, a statewide move to expand a program and what that resulted in because there wasn't the staff to fill in is we had really unqualified folks running this particular expansion and I, I'm, I'm nervous about what we're going to see. So I, I, I don't know if staff has any insights into, into this particular concern of mine. Um, we've been talking uh, in the in regards to ELOP, the extended learning. Uh, we already partner with the city of Fremont, and so we're looking at um, possibly doing expanding partnerships. Um, and so that is the number one question about staffing. Um, the different uh, uh, partnerships that we're looking at, um, they've been very successful. And so what we're seeing across the state uh, in terms of ELOP is that a lot of districts are partnering with like the boys and girls clubs or any kind of agency like that within their local context. Uh, and so um, we're very confident in that, depending on if we go down that route with the partnership, um, that they've been very successful with staffing uh, for these programs. So I think we'll be okay. I don't want to put that under, but I, I'm, I'm confident in that. I think Trustee Jones articulates really well uh, something that we struggle with, which is every time the state passes a, a new initiative, and oftentimes these are very, like TK is a great example. That is a something that I think everyone can support, but there are costs incurred with it. And <laughs> it's always a challenge to fit in what is the uh, objective uh, within the budget. Uh, Mr. Lechner. On that note, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to express my gratitude to all the educators and staff present mm -hmm. for making do with so little money in the state that is burdened by demographics that make it so hard to educate the young and spend money uh, on families. So thank you very much for working under these conditions for all of us. We certainly appreciate every, all the community support. It's, um, it's an exciting job, but it, it's an interesting bureaucracy we live under, I'll say that. Um, Mr. Gardner. Uh, speaking as a union man, I know I don't. Oh, you went mute. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking as a, an educator, I never blame any of the administrators or any of the trustees. I know everyone here, we're all on the same team, but just letting you know, like as a union man, we're negotiating hard for compensation. We think that's going to be a real way to make this the actual hiring problem is to outcompete other districts around us. So as a Union City teacher, I want you guys to just like drop it down real low so you, all the teachers come over to Union <laughs> City. But the laws of economics still apply is that you have to pay teachers to do the job. So we we want to be good people, but we also need to get paid because we're living here too. All right. So, uh, 
um, Miss Linus, you can redirect me if if not, but I'm just, are there any sort of ideas that maybe you've come and thought, maybe that's an interesting, maybe that would be a, a, something that would help our students. I think we're in enough of the brainstorming phase that we can entertain some ideas because when you see the, you know, when we bring a draft of the report to you, you're going to be like, oh, how did that get in there? So there's some interesting things in there, but they all have a history. And so if we're going to add or, or make some alterations, you know, we need, we need ideas. And that's why we're, we're trying to cast as wide of a net as possible. Yes, Ms. Lee. Yes, and I, I'm, I'm linking it back. Those of you that were with the LCAT committee last year, I know that one of the things that was very um, at the forefront for us was continuing to support our unhoused uh, youth, our unhoused students. And so we had this wonderful presentation um, uh, not, also from Mr. Bailey, but also a nonprofit. So I know one of the things that I've heard from some families is continuing to have the um, the liaison, uh, that connection, that human connection to students. Um, and, and that's a stipend um, that we provide for our employees at the school site. So having uh, the homeless liaison um, was something that I remember came up last year. Um, so if there's any ideas around that, um, I also know that one of the things that's been coming up, and I'll have Christy speak more to it, is, um, you know, as we're starting to, to look at continuing to try to attract more students to Fremont Unified, one of the ideas that came forward was about looking at targeting and creating uh, magnet schools. And I'll let Christy speak a little bit. We've heard from some principals around this, so maybe she can also share some of the ideas. Yeah, um, there's been uh, some discussion, I know, at the board level and uh, talking about just kind of to Mr. Chen's um, idea about having enrichment opportunities for our students, uh, in particular, uh, unduplicated um, through our charge through LCAC, around looking at ways to not only uh, possibly uh, you know, increase enrollment at certain sites, but also to provide opportunities, a rich uh, opportunity for students at some of our students uh, schools that have a high unduplicated count. Um, so that has kind of been something that has been new that's been floating around about uh, potentially um, providing or looking at a goal and action around that uh, for some of our sites, again, with that high unduplicated count to kind of go through maybe uh, explore different themes. Um, you know, we currently have the immersion programs and the science magnet at Matos, but there are a lot of opportunities to kind of expand upon that. Um, for example, uh, PBL, which is project-based learning through the Buck Institute, um, which is really good and would really provide some great um, enrichment and opportunities for our students. Um, we've heard at the board level, sometimes there's been some discussion about, you know, even like an art magnet of some sort. So that's kind of been floating around as that might be a kind of a out of the box, unique uh, way uh, to kind of really support our site and our unduplicated students in not only the core program, but uh, provide more of an enrichment as well. Uh, Ms. Dameron? Um, this evening, we heard the presentation about the expansion of transitional kindergarten. We know that in the coming years, construction willing, that we will be moving to the middle school model. Are we, where, are, what did we learn from the two schools that have become middle schools? Are there potential programs, staffing, counseling, behavioral support, social work, needs that we might have in bridging all these students to, to make our middle school model robust, effective, and supporting unduplicated as well as other populations. We haven't, I, I feel like we haven't really touched on that. So we, there are some uh, staffing uh, that goes along with that transition and I think we could probably give some summaries of some other activities that were done in the past at, at the next meeting. 
Yeah, we have within the LCAP, so if we're looking at the context of LCAP, uh, there is funding around the web program where every, I think it's where everyone, everyone belongs. belongs. Yeah, um, and that is, um, again, making that bridge between elementary into junior high where you have mentor uh, seventh and eighth graders who kind of are mentors to the sixth graders and just having to build that cohesive um, school environment, um, you know, especially for students who are transitioning into that. So there are some things within the LCAP that we're supporting around that piece. Um, are there any other uh, comments? Ah, Mr. Chen. Um, I like uh, Anne's comment um, about the middle school, and I totally agree with that. But, um, you know, my daughter um, was out of the Fremont Unified for her first year. And what I observed in a different school district was even among the first and second and third and uh, second graders exchanges. Obviously, during COVID, you know, that there's a limited uh, ability to do that. But as you're saying, you know, having mentorship, you know, from and coaching from older students to younger students, even if it's just to escort them to the library and show them about, you know, different books that they're reading and, you know, having that type of exchange is, um, I think, really important. Um, yeah. One of the things that um, the two current uh, middle schools and then the future middle schools will have are designated areas um, where sixth grade classes are intended to be. So sixth grade classes are usually uh, are our groups together also they have less transition during the day than other secondary students so that is built into the structure and we found a lot of success with that so that's a good example of what what Ms. Dameron is referring to other thoughts and questions this goes back to um, the longer program about staff resources and I know it's always um, you know, question of having professionals, paraprofessionals, and volunteers. And, you know, this it's, it's a big problem to tackle because we do have the unions and we do have, you know, um, the need to have professional um, folks overseeing the kids. Uh, but how do we grow the ranks of a paraprofessional or a volunteer officially in the school district? Or, you know, if we partner with this uh, city, you know, they also have civil service requirements. They also have to have descriptions of qualifications and testing for whatever it may be, fingerprinting and other stuff that needs to occur. And um, so, you know, is, do we need to spend a little bit of resource toward the HR? And, you know, it might be a multi-year look at trying to create additional staffing, appropriate staffing. And I'm, I'm not discounting the professional side because obviously, if we were in a situation where we had, you know, uh, licensed professionals <laughs> staff in every program, that would be great. But we already came to the conclusion that we had to have paraprofessionals. And how do we even go beyond that? Um, and, you know, in a school district where you have 30,000 plus and the parents, uh, many of whom have all types of degrees. I mean, even myself, you know, years ago, I was looking at it and saying I qualify to go get a teaching credential. Uh, just with the masters and getting a couple classes at a lonely college and i would be able to qualify and uh, meet all the district standards so is that is that something that we need to get information out there and beef up you know the volunteer corps with people registered but anyway that's just something to look at i, I mean i'm throwing it out there because it's it, it's not going to come from a administrator because it has to come from, you know from the whole as a program to say we have this um need and it's not a simple solution. And we need to bring all the people to the table to say, well, how do we write up these qualifications and requirements? You bring up an interesting point about what are some things we can do to encourage more community participation. Um, and you actually mentioned the fingerprinting, which is, uh, you know, you don't need a fingerprint for all of our volunteer things, but there are some uh, things. And that is an, uh, a, a roadblock for some people. Uh, to be able to participate. So, uh, yeah, we would have to engage with HR on that. And quickly, as a side note, if you're interested in being a secondary teacher, let me know. I can uh, set you up and uh, probably find a place for you. 
that's wonderful and and i and i know it's it's not uh directly related to the lcap but i think it is good to get the ideas out and and just as an fyi i have heard from the human resource department they're starting a partnership with the adult school so there may be some some plans out there so, so which that's some good news it's coming our way soon um but but I, I think it's a, a point well taken. Um, may I also ask, uh, you know, something that's intriguing is those transitions. So we heard from Mr. Chen as as students are transitioning um, to the junior high or uh, middle school model. Um, would there be another place where we could see that our unduplicated students would need support? And and particularly, I'm thinking about um, like the graduate looking at our graduation rate or A through G completion uh, for some of our students. Are there any ideas around that at the secondary level or what we have heard from from other parents or at our schools that might be something to look at? Uh, Ms. Chan? Um, I think when we think of the word transitional, we always think about sixth grade. Um, from elementary school to junior high, but um, junior high to high school is also a transitional year. So that's a place that we can consider, especially, um, let me think here, some of these kids that may have been in sixth grade in you know, the 1920 and then did an online year and then did one year in junior high and are now going to be going to high school. That is going to be um, um, one transition. So I think that could be another area where um, the, it's it's a very unique um, place um, because of what these kids have gone through in the last couple of years. Um, so that's one area I think we can look more heavily at. Um, and I think it's an area that we forget about just because it is always focused on elementary to um, junior high. So um, that's that's one idea I would kind of want to throw out there. Very good point. Very good. Um, Mr. Chen. Um, with regards to transition and whether it's going from elementary to junior high or junior out of high school. I mean, it looks like the district has a lot more information now through, you know, some of the testing and such. Um, we know whether some of the uh, unduplicated, especially language learner, uh, English uh, learners are out there, uh, whether they're ready to select their own courses. If they're marginal, should they be selecting French, you know, for their high, junior high school class? You know, um, we want them to advance as far as they can get. But, you know, uh, the parents have no idea when all of a sudden they're given the sheet and says select the classes. And they're also ranked, you know, ranked choice, right? Um, so for those unduplicated, you know, should they uh, have a selection and maybe guide it and have a sign off by a counselor or something so they understand what it is that they're selecting even? I'll let Ms. Shipper go. I have um, a son who's in high school, but he he had help he's also on an iep and is in resource he always had counselors helping him choose his classes in middle school or it was then um walter's junior high and now he's in high school he's a junior he still has those counselors helping him out with those going one-on-one -on -one with his resource teacher to make sure that in the future you're on track to not only graduate be able but also be able to do other things beyond high school, like go to college, go do this, go do that, go to a trade school. What do you have to have in place? What's the minimum for California? But what do you need for yourself to be successful once you step out those doors? So there is some support there, but that doesn't mean we can't give them more support. That's a great point. Um, Trustee Prasad? Yeah, extending that those comments to <clears throat> perhaps the the even the advanced courses, right? Uh, while we we talk about uh, the the registration process, so for for these students, how do we how are we guiding them on, let's say even the AP selections? So uh, th those are even more daunting, and and people the students make mistakes in how many they pick, or sometimes they don't pick enough, and sometimes they pick too many. We definitely, um, at the end, I, I see, oh, oh, Mr. Gardner, go. I don't need to monologue anymore. Uh, just responding to uh, Ms. Shipper's comments about resource in particular, because that's actually my job um, out over at Union City. And it is a great thing 
um, to be able to have the time to sit down with the students on my caseload and go over what they need to graduate, what they need to go straight to a four-year university, what different options there are, like getting letting them know how to apply for trade schools. But um, all of those things are very labor-intensive. Um, and if wishes were wings, then every student would have like a case carrier that would be able to have a caseload of just like 20 kids um, to deal with. But I do think that the best solution that's practical is decreasing counselors caseload size because counselors can do it. They have a much more efficient system. And if they just have less students that they need to manage, then it becomes more possible for the counselors to provide that service. Not quite as well as one to 28, but um, if you decrease their caseload size, that just makes it more possible to do that. Yes, um, and I, I will jump in here a bit. The, um, this is a, a real challenge because the, we do have a, we have more counselors than we used to have, but we still don't have enough. You know, if you think about if every student was able to have just a 15 minute conversation and you had say 400 students on your caseload, which would be kind of on the low side, if you divide that by 60, that's 100 hours just meeting with students on their schedules. That's possible, but considering all the other job responsibilities, it's a challenge. So I think what we need to do is to find different ways that we can um, help the community make these decisions because we do not, we, we, but frankly, we make it challenging for them, considering that most students in secondary up to grade nine have pretty much the same schedule. You have this class, this class. It's mostly just an elective choice. So we do we do make it hard for parents sometimes. Ms. Chan? Um, I do agree with uh, Mr. Gardner there on, on reducing the counselor's caseloads. And I know that we are limited in what we can do, but... Um, you know, if we are able to do that, I know that the time that the students get with the counselor, whether it's for um, emotional support, academic support, or, or picking classes, it's all really important. So I do think it provides more than just um, class, you know, choosing for um, future goals. But I think also is just um, equipping our parents, especially our immigrant parents. Um, when I have parent teacher conferences in sixth grade, and they're asking me about AP classes, and their children are still in sixth grade, um, you know, and and part of it too, is they, uh, they will openly tell me I didn't go to college here. So I need to know, how does this system work? And so providing just that kind of information to our parents, um, in, in different languages too, and just helping them, you know, help their children pick classes that can um, provide for them to be successful, kind of like um, Anna was saying earlier, and wherever they want to go, whether it's vocational school or um, art school or traditional four-year college, you know, whatever that they choose so that they're able to navigate those goals that way. Um, and I do think that that doesn't start in high school. Um, it does start um, lower. I mean, in sixth grade, my my students will ask me, what, what class should I pick yearbook? Should I pick French? Should I pick Spanish? And, um, you know, I'm having flashbacks to when I had to pick my classes in high school um, and not knowing what to pick. So I think that it's also important that we um, just give information to parents on, on how to best support th uh, their children too. So I, um, I do see a couple hands up, but I, um, I do know <laughs> we kind of started on talking about secondary math. Um, so I did want to just redirect if Everybody has probably had an experience of struggling with math in secondary schools or having, uh, more frustratingly sometimes, a student, a, a child of theirs struggling in math. Um, we'd love to get your thoughts on what we can do. And if you want to think about it over the next few weeks till our next meeting, that's great too. But what are some things that we can do to support math uh, students who are struggling? I just want to make sure we come around to that point um, too. And I know we have limited time. So Mr. Gardner. Uh, I would speak on that, and I'm kind of a broken record, but I um, mean there's actual data to show it, is that freshman level math having a lower class size. Uh, that's what we do over in Union City. We just know that because of how many students fail Algebra 1 their freshman year, you just want to have a lower class size. And uh, I don't think there's many other solutions. It's just there's certain key subjects that are challenges. You just need to have funding for a lower class size for those subjects. And I think math is one of them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ms. Salinas? Yes, um, what I heard from some of the parents was also workshops and support 
um, around how to support their students at home and just kind of having that that knowledge base. And so um, they really were speaking to just having some hands-on workshops, something that they can kind of like, we used to do the make and take and all of that. And I know that uh, Chrissy's department, they have definitely amped up on the pre parent presentations. And a lot of our parents are saying, you know, we're, we're ready to go. We just want to be able to have access and just some of the tools so that we can know and plan in advance. So I think continuing with, with that um, will be important. Uh, Mr. Khan. Yes, thank you. Um, in response to your question, I think um, like on the other spectrum where like students may be like challenging themselves with higher classes, um, like advanced classes, whether that's accelerated or honors or whatever it may be, um, most students in those classes, I would say in my sophomore year, I was in one of those classes, uh, maybe 90 to 95% of those of my peers like had outside tutoring. So that did put them at an advantage in terms of the content that they learned. Um, I did not have outside tutoring. Um, however, like since everyone else did, the teacher kind of assumed that, you know, I don't have to really, really go over this content since you guys know it out elsewhere. And that caused me to fall behind and a lot of other students who who didn't have that outside tutoring. So I think like just the expectation should be to follow the content as is and not like change it up just because student, some students may or may not have um, outside help um, just to maintain like um, equity based on, you know, if students don't have the resources or they just choose not to get that outside tutoring. That's an excellent point. Um, it's actually something that was noted in the data from uh, Challenge Success that we're presenting at the board meeting tomorrow. Um, we have about four minutes remaining. Are there any other, uh, Ms. Salinas, do you want to ask any more directing questions to help this process? No, I think I, I've got some great notes. Um, I think um, we could summarize that we hope to bring back maybe uh, some kind of a graphic organizer or an update of something in writing for you all to react to of what we heard tonight, um, what we heard from DLAC and, you know, uh, and some of the parent groups. Uh, we also will be sharing this information uh, with some other parent groups as well. And so that's all going to help to inform the writing of of the LCAP, but um, I don't know, Christy, did I leave anything else out? Okay. Um, so we are we are at the end. Um, I believe we need to do the reaffirmation. Are we still we still continue to? Do that? No, no, we don't do that anymore. I was wondering that 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 had changed. <laughs> We're good. So, all right. So uh, if there's Nothing else, I'll give it a minute. Just if anybody has anything, I'll raise their hand. Uh, Ms. Chan? Um, given that this meeting got moved a couple times, are we still planning to meet on um, April 6th? I, th I think it's the 6th, That our, our original April date. As far as I know, yes, uh, okay. I'll confirm. With Steve, do we have any other? It's April April fifth. Yeah. April fifth. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah, I just wanted to confirm we're still um, planning on on meeting then. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Lechner. Sorry, my neighbor just started mowing his lawn. Could we try to identify the caller, please? Oh, excuse me. Yes, uh, we have a caller here um, in the. Uh, Miss Salinas called uh, uh, previously. And it's, yes, go ahead. Oh, hi. Do you want me to identify myself? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Anjanette Pelletier. I'm a longtime uh, Fremont resident and um, um, have been listening to your meeting and hope to continue joining with you when you have meetings. I certainly had trouble logging on to both the Google Meet and the live stream. I seem to be locked out, but I was able to listen today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and we, we very much apologize. This has been a, Ms. Salinas and I have been texting about this, so we, we <laughs> certainly apologize for the technical problem. Thank, you for, Thank you for your persistence. Our apologies. Yeah. Last week, I had no problem. I logged right on and could see everybody, but this week, <laughs> I was locked out. So. Go figure. 
Thank you very much. Okay, um, I don't think we have anything else. I know that Mr. Lechner um, had emailed us, so we may have something on the agenda next time. I can't talk about it too much, but it's essentially we need to look at um, our membership and folks that have not been coming and have and have been coming. Mr. Lechner, as as our as our secretary, has alerted us to some of the attendance, and so what I'm going to do is I'll be reaching out to those folks, and and if we do need to make some changes, I'll bring that back for the next um, agenda item. The next time. All right. Well, thank you very much for everyone, and uh, we will see you on the 5th of April. Thank you. Thank you all.